Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Um, in this lecture 18, we're going to start the very short chapter in Tom Judson's Abstract Algebra textbook um, about cosets in Lagrange's theorem, chapter 6. Section 6.1 is going to be our cosets, and that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time in this uh, in this chapter, we'll spend two lectures on it, and then we'll talk about Lagrange's theorem in chapter and Lagrange's theorem in chapter in lecture 19. Excuse me. So let's first define the titular topic of this chapter here: cosets. What is a coset? So a coset is a, are, are structures. They're sets, uh, subsets of a group. And so let's give a little bit of terminology. Let's say that G is a group. Um, this could be a finite group, it could be an infinite group, doesn't make any bit of a difference in this definition. And then we're going to take a subgroup of G. So by subgroup, we're taking a group inside of a group using that same uh, binary operation. And the restriction of the binary operation to H gives a well-defined operation on H. And so therefore, H is a subset of G, which is closed under multiplication. It contains the identity. It contains the, the inverses. And you're going to see those three principles come into play in this lecture. Why is it so important that H is a subgroup for the following definition? So given a subgroup of a group G, we define the, a left coset of H with representative little g inside the group as the following set. This will be denoted little g times h, and this will consist of all products of the form little g times little h, where little h is allowed to vary over the elements of the subgroup h. We'll see examples of this in just a second. This is an example of what we call a left coset. This is the left coset of g, the representative there, okay? Uh, the set of all left cosets will be denoted as g slash h, and we do use a forward slash right there when we're describing the, the left cosets, g, uh, g slash h. Oftentimes, this is read as g mod h for reasons that will become more clear in future chapters. Uh, specifically, let's see, I think with Judson's textbook, that would be chapter, oh boy, chapter 9, I think. Seven is about cryptography, eight is about coding theory. So I think chapter nine is when we get to quotient groups. Uh, but don't quote me on that one, even though it's now record for, recorded for time and memoriam in this video right here. So we have G mod H is the set of all left cosets. Similarly, we can define uh, what's called a right coset. A right coset will denote this as G, uh, G slash, or sorry, let's say one more time, H slash G. Um, this is going to be the set of all products of the form little h, little g, where g is a specific fixed element of the group. We call it the representative of the coset. And then little h is allowed to vary over the elements of h right there. And so this is why we call it a right coset, because we're writing the representative on the right side of h. And as opposed to a left coset, the representative g shows up on the left side of the subgroup. And in general, since a group is non-abelian, we will see that the left cosets and the right cosets might not match up. Uh, and so distinguishing between the two is very important. Uh, the, set of, the set of right cosets, we are going to denote H backslash G. So notice the different ordering right there. So for right cosets, we write the H slash the G. But for the left cosets, we write G slash the H. All right. And the direction does depend on things. We have a forward slash here. We have a backslash right here. Um, if you are do, using LaTeX and you want to type the right cosets here, you have to be a little bit cautious because the normal backslash is actually a protected character because this is how you start commands. So if you actually want to write the symbol backslash, you use the command backslash backslash. That's kind of fun, right? Uh, so you actually just spell it out, backslash, backslash. That's how you get the backslash symbol if you need to talk about right cosets. And the idea why we move things around is supposed to be analogous to the cosets themselves. So when you write a left coset, you have some element of G times H right there. And so that's what we do right here. We have a G on the left, H on the right. For the right cosets, we do the same thing. Um, we have H slash G, where G is on the right because that's where the representatives go, and H is on the left because that's where the cosets, uh, that's where the subgroups would go. And so like I said, it should, it should be very important that in general, we do not have it it's not true that GH is equal to HG. That, of course, is true for abelian groups, and it is true for it's true for special cases in non-abelian groups, but in general, that's not a true statement. I should be saying that it's not equal. I keep on saying not equal, but I didn't write that on the screen. 
So the left coset is not necessarily the same thing as the right coset. Let's see some examples of that. So let's first start off with a, a fairly simple group. We'll take uh, the, I, I say simple, of course, in that it's not complicated, not in terms of how simple groups are usually defined. Check that out in a different video, actually, what I mean by that. But let's take the group Z6. It's a cyclic group. And let's take the subgroup generated by the element three. Um, so just as a remind, reminder, uh, this is that group right here. H is generated by three. You're going to get zero and three. This is a cyclic group of order two inside of a cyclic group of order six. What are the cosets of this group going to look like? Well, the first idea is what, you know, if we go through the six elements of Z6, the first one is a zero. So what happens if we take zero plus H? Well, if you take zero plus H, you're going to take zero plus zero, which is equal to zero, and you're going to take zero plus three, which is equal to three. And so notice in this situation that zero plus H is just going to give you the set zero comma three. That's of course just the original subgroup H itself. And you're going to see that in general. If you take the coset represented by the identity of the group, you will just re reproduce the original, uh, the original subgroup. What if we take one plus H? In that situation, you're going to take one plus zero, which is one, and you're going to take one plus three, which is equal to four. So we get the elements one and three, like so. Uh, because of this first observation, because a subgroup always contains an identity, um, you're always going to have your representative combined with your identity. So for any group under the sun, if you're looking at GH right here, you have to consider G times the identity, which is equal to G, which shows that the coset represented by G always contains G itself. So one plus H in our example will contain, excuse me, will contain H, but it also contains, why did I write plus three? Uh, that, should be plus, that should be a four right there, one and four. All right, the next one we're gonna take is two plus H. And by a similar calculation, you're gonna get two plus zero, which is two, and you're gonna get two plus three, which is five, like so. And so that's getting, so we have three of the cosets, zero plus H, one plus H, and two plus H. If we take three plus H, what you're going to see is the following. You're going to take zero plus three, which is three, and you're going to get three plus three, which is six, but as we're working mod six, that becomes a zero. Now, if you're having a little bit of deja vu, you'll notice that, oh, three, zero, that's actually just the subgroup H, which is also the coset zero plus H. So one thing I'm going to mention here is that this coset's already on the list, and so I'm actually going to write it right here. This is three plus H. All right, um, what about four plus H? If you take four plus H, that would be zero plus four, which is four. And then you're gonna take three plus four, which is seven, which reduces to one mod six. Wait a second, we already have that coset listed as well. So I'm actually gonna get rid of this and just record it up here. One plus H and four plus H are actually the same coset. Um, and then the last one to consider is five plus H, but you might see where this is going here. Um, five plus zero is gonna be five. And five plus three is gonna be eight, which reduces to two mod six. So two plus H and five plus H are actually the same cosets again. And you'll notice here that two plus H will contain two and five plus H will contain five. So it kind of sees, I kind of see the connection there. One plus H will contain one, but four plus H has to contain four, okay. Um, and then lastly, zero plus H will contain zero and three plus H will contain three. So I mentioned earlier how the representative has to be in the coset, but it turns out that when there was any overlap with the cosets, they actually had to be the exact same coset. Let's look some more examples of this. This time, let's look at a, a non-abelian group because if we go back to this abelian group, I can also tell you that in all of these cases, you know, zero plus H will be the same thing as H plus zero. Um, one plus H is the same thing as H plus one. Two plus H is the same thing as H plus two. Three plus H is the same thing as H plus three. And four plus H will be the same thing as H plus four, and likely H plus uh, five plus H will be the same thing as H plus five. Because Z6 is an abelian group, the operation is commutative, and there's no distinction between left cosets and right cosets. That distinction only shows up for non abelian groups. So let's look at a non abelian group. Let's take another group of order six, but this time we're going to take the symmetric group S3, which contains the six permutations. And let's take the subgroup generated by the permutation, the three cycle, one, two, three. That actually coincides with the alternating group, A3, the even permutations, the identity, the three cycle, one, two, three, and its inverse, one, three, two. So let's consider those cosets there. 
So in this situation, um, what we can look at is we have the identity times h. Well, if you take the identity, like we said before, this is just going to give you back the original subgroup h. And so this will contain 1, the identity, 1, 2, 3, the 3 cycle, and it's inverse 1, 3, 2. So the coset represented by the identity is always just the original subgroup. Nothing big going on there. Um, notice if we take the 3 cycle 1, 2, 3, what's going to happen here is you're going to get 1, 2, 3 times the identity. You're going to get 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2, 3. And then you're going to get 1, 2, 3 times 1, 3, 2. So we have to simplify each of those. Well, if you take if you take 1, 2, 3 times the identity, you're just going to get 1, 2, 3. Oh, we have that element there. Um, if you take 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2, 3, you get 1, 2, 3 squared, which is actually 1, 3, 2. And then lastly, if you take 1, 2, 3 times its inverse, 1, 3, 2, you're going to get the identity. So although it got put in a different order, when you take 1, 2, 3, h, you're going to get all of the elements in h back. So ironically, multiplying by this permutation permutes the elements of h, but it's still the same it's still all the same elements. So we're going to notice here that, and I don't need the color coding here anymore, that the coset 1, 2, 3, H is just H. It's just the subgroup H right here. And we're going to see a very similar thing if we do 1, 3, 2, H. You're going to get something similar. You're going to get 1, 3, 2 times 1, which of course is 1, 3, 2. You're going to get 1, 3, 2 times 1, 2, 3, which as those are inverses, you get the identity. And then lastly, you're going to get 1, 3, 2 times 1, 3, 2, which is 1, 3, 2 squared, which is actually its inverse 1, 2, 3. And so that's that coset. And so by similar reasoning, we see that you're going to get 1, 3, 2 times h. All right. And so the the these three cosets, 1H, 123H, and 132H, all produce the same coset, which is just the original subgroup H right there. Well, is something different going to happen? What if we take 1, 2 times H? In that situation, uh, we're going to end up with 1, 2 times the identity, which is 1, 2. Then the next one we're going to get is 1, 2 times 1, 2, 3. And so think about what happens there. 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, so 1 is going to be fixed. Uh, 2 goes to 3, there's no other 3, so 2 is going to go to 3. And then 3 goes to 1, which 1 goes to 2. So we end up with the 2 cycle, 2, 3. And then the last possibility is we're going to take 1, 2 times 1, 3, 2. And if you go through the product this time, 1 goes to 3, so 1 is going to go to 3. Uh, next, we're going to get that 3 goes to 2 and 2 goes to 1. And then lastly, 2 goes to 1 and 1 goes to 2. So 2 is going to be left fixed, and we have a... Two cycle again, the other two cycle, uh, which one's left? What did I say it was? Uh, one goes to three and three goes to two. Uh, sorry, three goes to one. And so what you see here is that the that the coset generated by one, two, represented by one, two, gives you all the two cycles, one, two, two, three, and one, three. And I want you to convince yourself, you know, pause the video if you need to. Uh, if you take the, the coset from... Uh, the, the coset represented by 2, 3, you'll get the exact same set. And if you take the coset 1, 3, it'll also give you the exact same set. So there turns out to be only two cosets. There's the coset H and the coset 1, 2, H. Although you have some variety on the representatives you could choose. Now, I also want you to convince yourself that each and every one of these cosets actually is equal to its right coset. So if we put the representative on the other side, we would get the exact same coset that we had before. So this is another example where the left and right, right cosets actually agree with each other. And oh, that's kind of interesting. But I, I, again, I want you to convince yourself why that is. I'm going to look at just H12, for example. If you take 1 times H12, Notice, of course, that'll just give you 1, 2 again. Um, if you take 2, 3 times 1, 2, uh, you're going to get 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, and then 3 goes, what did I say? 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3. Great. 
Then the next one, oh, I'm sorry, I know what I'm doing wrong here. Something felt fishy. I need to not take things from the cosine. I need to take things from the subgroup right here. So I need to take one, two, three times one, two, because let's get into three cycles. Like that's not right. Um, if you didn't do this one, this is the correct one. One goes to two, two goes to three. Great. Then three goes to one, and then two goes to one, one goes to two. So you get you get the two cycle one, three that you see right there. And then lastly, if we do one, three, two times one, two, you're going to see that one goes to two, two goes to one. So one is fixed. Uh, two goes to one, one goes to three, and then three goes to two, which gives you the two, the two, three, two, three right there, that two cycle. So even though you sw move things to the other side, you do end up getting the same coset, the left and right coset. Now, this is not always the case. Let me show you one final example here in this video. This time, we're going to stick with the same group. So G is still going to be the symmetric group S3, but this time take the cyclic subgroup generated by one, two. What happens in this situation? Well, I'm gonna show you that if you take the identity times K, this is gonna equal, of course, just K itself, which is the group one and one, two. And I also want you to convince yourself that if you take one, two times K, that's gonna be the same thing, all right? Now, admittedly, in this situation, if you take K1, that's the same thing because the identity commutes with everything. It's central to the group. Therefore, that's not going to change. And it's also true that if you take K times one, two, that's going to give you, that'll give you the same coset because these are all just equal to K in that situation. So as I keep on showing all these cosets that are the same left and right, but fine, fine. Here we are. Here we are. Here's the, here's the point now we want to get to. What happens when we take one, two, three times K? All right. If you take one, two, three, you're going to get one, two, three times the identity, which is one, two, three. And if you take uh, one, two, three times one, two, I think we already did this calculation, but let's just do it again for the sake of practice. One goes to two, two goes to three, great. And then three goes to one, great. And then you see that two is fixed. So you get the, you get the two cycle, one, three, like so. Wonderful. Um, on the other hand, and, and this is gonna be the same thing as one, three, which is K right there. And let's let's finish up our list. One, three, two if you times that by k. Again, I'm gonna kind of speed through the calculation. You're gonna get one, three, two times the identity, which is itself. And then you're gonna get one, three, two times one, two. I want you to convince yourself that's the two cycle, two, three. All right, so this, and this also is the, the coset, the left coset, two, three, k. These are the left cosets. Let's then set these side by side with the right cosets. If this time we take if we take K times one, two, three, what happens? Well, you're gonna get the identity times one, two, three, which is one, two, three. But then the next thing, we're supposed to take one, two times one, two, three, which this time you get one goes to two, two goes to one, so one is fixed, two goes to three, and then three goes to one, which goes back to two. So we actually end up with the two cycle, two, three which this is the same thing as the right coset K times two, three. So notice the disagreement right here. One, two, three K is not the same thing as K one, two, three, because one, two, three K contains the two cycle one, three, but the right coset contains the two cycle two, three. So those things actually disagree with each other. Like I told you they would. One, two, three K does not equal K times one, two, three. All right, we also saw that if you take the left coset represented by one, three, it'll contain one, two, three, and one, three. But if you take the right coset represented by two, three, you're going to get, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Here's the, here's two, three, K there. If you take the coset, the left coset for two, three, you're gonna have two, three, and one, three, two. But the right coset will contain two, three, but it will contain one, two, three, right? These three cycles are different. That's not the same coset. And so what we've now seen is that the left coset for two, three is not the same thing as the right coset for two, three. And we're gonna see something similar happening right here. If you take, if you take the coset, the right coset for one, three, two, you end up with the elements one, three, two, and the two cycle one, three. I'll let you calculate that to convince yourself of that. And so this is the right coset for one, three, two, and the right coset for one, three. 
and you see some disagreement going on here. The left coset for 1, 3, 2 contains itself, but it also contains 2, 3, but the right coset contains 1, 3. So you see that 1, 3, 2, or excuse me, 1, 3, 2, K does not equal K, 1, 3, 2. So those cosets disagree with each other, the left and right cosets. And then finally, we also saw that the right coset for 1, 3 contains the 3 cycle, 1, 3, 2, but the left coset contains, um, excuse me, contains 1, 2, 3, which would be this one right here. And so then summarizing, we see that 1, 3, K does not equal K times 1, 3. So in the case of the symmetric group, we see that for this cosets associated to the cyclic subgroup generated by 1, 2, the left and right cosets do not necessarily agree with each other. And that's something we have to pay attention to, that the left and right cosets in general do not agree. This is very common for non-abelian groups. It, it, they necessarily agree for abelian groups, but for non-abelian groups, they can disagree with each other. Do they automatically disagree? No. We saw that the cosets for the alternating group actually were the same left and right. But in general, we cannot anticipate that they're going to equal each other.